this is your five minute geography lesson. We're covering theme three, element eight, human vulnerabilities. Thinking hats on, I'm Mr. S and I'll be your five minute teacher. Human vulnerabilities alter the risk of the hazard. The more vulnerable an area or its population is, then the greater the potential risk from that hazard. We're gonna to look today at a whole host of different types of vulnerabilities. In the revision guide, we focus on four in a bit more detail. Today we're going to have a look at all of them in a small bit of detail. And they're all represented by an icon surrounding our slide. And we're going to start in the top left. You might want to see if you can guess what each of these vulnerabilities is before we start each one. Well, this one is to do with wealth and GDP. So GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product. And it's essentially the amount of money that a country makes based on what it produces, manufactures, sells, exports, and all of that. But we can also talk about this in terms of HIC and LIC, which we're a bit more confident with. Money allows a government to do a lot more in terms of preparation. What are they doing before the hazard potentially comes around to make sure that people are safe, they know what they're doing, are the buildings up to scratch, would they resist an earthquake, and it links to every other factor that's on this slide that we're going to go through. Poorer countries like LICs aren't going to have the money in order to respond to a, a hazard effectively. And they're more likely to need outside help, so aid from international sources, in order to get themselves back on their feet. So money is a very important and very tangible vulnerability for some countries. The second one here is to do with population density. So this is the number of people per square kilometer that reside in an area. Let's say it's a city. There's gonna be a lot more people crammed into a small space and if an earthquake hit directly under the city, well, a lot more people are gonna be affected than a village out in the countryside. We're gonna have the potential for more buildings to collapse. We're gonna have the potential for more electricity and gas lines to be cut and cause fires. Whereas in the village, it's not as many buildings, there's not as much potential infrastructure to be damaged, the risk to life is less, and the risk from falling buildings and the overall cost is also less because there's less people in that area. The next one is linked and that's called infrastructure. Infrastructure could be the road network, gas, electricity, it can be also key services such as hospitals, the actual building itself. Infrastructure can be linked back to wealth. Wealthier countries, HICs, are more likely to put more money into developing infrastructure that can resist the hazard. So bridges that which are earthquake proof, buildings like hospitals which can flow and flex with an earthquake as it happens. Poorer countries are going to struggle with that. Infrastructure also allows emergency services to get to the hazard quicker, allows the country to respond to that hazard in a timely manner. And if your infrastructure isn't up to scratch and the roads buckle or they get covered in debris, your emergency services are going to struggle to get there in time. The next one, represented by the mortarboard here, is education. And we're not just talking about the education that you are receiving right now. Education also includes do people that live in an earthquake prone area or do people from an area next to a volcano know what to do if a warning goes out or whether uh, earthquake happens? Do they know that they need to go to the smallest room in their house? Do they know that to stand in the doorway, not to run out into the street if they don't have to? All of this is going to help reduce the vulnerability because it's going to lessen their injury and death because people know how to respond properly. The next one is probably the hardest to interpret from this diagram. But if I said that these circles represent shock waves, the actual waves of energy from the earthquake, we're talking about the proximity to the hazard. How close was that location to where the actual hazard occurred? So if we say that these black dots represent cities, well, these two cities are gonna be worse affected by the hazard than this one, because they're closer to where that earthquake occurred. If this dot in the center, my red pointer, was a city, that would represent the earthquake happening directly below it. So all that energy is gonna be directed upwards all that ground shaking, so it doesn't matter what other things you've got going on in terms of vulnerabilities or responses, 
you're going to be worse affected than this city out in the distance because over time that energy dissipates it becomes less the further away from the center of that earthquake or the volcano it is the next one is government and the government are the people that decide what happens they decide what planning to put in place what laws to put in place they decide where the money is going to be spent so are we going to spend money on designing new infrastructure are we going to put it into education they also decide when support is given so they decide when to send in the emergency services to different areas they decide whether or not to prioritize one location over another if there's a strain on resources do you help the capital city because that's where it's got the most people or do you help perhaps a worse affected place but it doesn't have as many people there that's the sort of decisions that need to be made now a good government will have considered and planned for the potential risks in their area so if they know that they've got a uh, prone to earthquakes then they should have planned and put in place education and infrastructure they should have directed money into the correct locations in order to support that some governments that's just not a priority for them or they might not actually have the money or the capability to do those things beforehand the next one is relief this is the shape of the land if we take in a volcano for an example here if you have a valley and you've got a volcano at one end of the valley and at the opposite end of the valley you've got a town when that pyroclastic flow and ash comes out of that volcano it's going to be directed down the side of the volcano into the valley and it's going to travel down that valley and it's going to be funneled straight into that town so that's the shape of the land directing where that pyroclastic flow is going to travel if you had a flat plain and a volcano at one end and a town at the other it's not dead certain that that pyroclastic flow would travel in that direction because it could go out in many other directions the shape of the land is affecting it but similarly the actual construction of the land if you've got lots of loose sediments like sedimentary rock during earthquakes this can actually amplify the shock waves it can make it worse because it vibrates or it can create liquefaction which is going to destroy buildings because the foundation is disrupted and then finally we have emergency services we've talked about them already but do your emergency services have the training in order to respond to a hazard do they have the appropriate equipment do they have sniffer dogs to sniff out trapped people do they have jaws of life to open up cars that are crushed have they been given the money that they need in order to effectively operate in a very highly stressful and fast moving situation which brings us to the end but also to consider the fact that these vulnerabilities are not shown in isolation so one hazard won't purely rely on the fact that the population is high or low it will be linked to all of these factors and they all influence the vulnerability of an area now they're in a circle because in lessons we would usually go through these and try and make a mind map or a concept map so we'd say well how does wealth link to education how does government link to infrastructure how does population density and proximity uh, to hazard link because all of these things are interrelated and they all influence each other well that's it for today but continue your revision by completing the now try task for homework class dismissed